Human beings made these cave paintings as much as 30,000 years ago. Biologically, their brains were exactly the same as ours today. For example, their brains and ours both recognize that the rhino's repeated horns represent motion, and we both are emotionally affected by flute music played in the cave chambers. In some caves, adjacent paintings were made 5,000 years apart by people whose ways of life had changed very little throughout that span of time. These ancestors were not simple people. Their daily life consisted of thousands of cultural details telling, for example, how to greet others, how to harvest animals from the region, celebrate births and marriages, and mourn deaths. If a newborn infant was somehow transported from that time to today, he or she would learn today's way of life and is as likely and capable as today's children to become an artist, engineer, or doctor. Some 10,000 years ago, a change in climate forced some of us in certain locations, such as in Mesopotamia and ancient Iraq, to become full-time farmers. By chance, this was the key to the abundance that enabled and required us to form cities and pool efforts to build civilization. The same human being now makes spaceships using nothing but our animal minds. Five. All three engines up and burning. Two, one, zero, and lift off the final lift off of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. America will. What is daily life like for those of us human beings who are gather hunters? A description of the joys and concerns of daily life for Nisa, who is a Nakung woman living in the Kalahari Desert, is given in the book Nisa, the life and words of a Nakung woman. For a couple million years, or a hundred thousand generations, each and every one of our biological ancestors were gather hunters who each lived just as did their previous generations. We do not change our way of life, which has worked for countless generations, unless we are forced to adopt a farming lifestyle due to either downturns in climate or cultural invasions. Still today, some of us human beings who live in the Brazilian rainforest, the densest forest of Papua New Guinea, or the Kalahari Desert have had the nearly undisturbed privilege of living as gather hunters until a few decades ago. The small number of remaining gather hunters live in the worst deserts where farming is hardly possible or in the densest forest that are so full of food that farming is hardly needed. Gather hunters live in small groups of 10 persons or sometimes a few dozen persons consisting of a few extended families. Each group member knows each person well enough to be able to predict his or her behavior in various circumstances. Still today, our brain has the capacity to know well this small number of persons because that has been the number of persons forming our society for 100,000 generations. For gatherer hunters, happiness occurs from food, love, children, extended family, friends, and the group and such. Still today these few things are the sources of our greatest joy. Notice that happiness has always been obtained from the love of others and not from electronics and machinery. In the Gather Hunter group we celebrate the milestones of life including birth, puberty, marriage, and death through ceremonies that have been handed down and slowly changed through countless generations. Group decisions are made by consensus of family heads. It is important to find a consensus to avoid the risk of splitting the group whose members share mutually dependent lives. At night, gather hunters might see the glowing eyes of a lion just outside the light of the fireplace and know that they cannot live alone. They worry about predators but do not know or worry of careers and such. 
Notice that you eat only 10 handfuls of food per day. It surprises us to learn that gather hunters spend only one or two hours per day collecting food, but they have only to collect 10 handfuls of food. Mostly fruits, nuts, insects, and potatoes and such. Hunting usually accounts for a smaller portion of everyday food. When hunters return with meat, we shout with happy joy that we will eat meat today. The entire group may begin dancing. Honey can also revoke such a response. A small portion of the food that you collect or hunt today is shared with other group members. This ensures that you eat even on those days that you had no luck gathering and hunting. This is a mutually beneficial exchange. It is not everyone for themselves. Daily conversation mostly concerns each other, just as it does today. The spoken grammar of gather hunters is as complex as that of any so-called modern language. Today's neuroscientists have found that the part of our brain that processes word order also processes sequence of steps in tool usage and other procedures. What is daily life like for gather hunters? There is lots of spare time spent singing, dancing, and enjoying the company of extended family members and friends. Each gather hunter group lives within a few days walk of other gather hunter groups. Groups meet frequently or seasonally to visit, celebrate, and conduct ceremonies. And all this gives young people a chance to fall in love. Marriage is what happens when young people are within a 10 days walk of each other. It is common for the members of group A to always choose spouses from group B, who in turn must always choose spouses from group C. This means that through 100,000 generations we were marrying our neighbors, not murdering them, as today's warring people might assume. If two families have too much of a fight, they might pick two of their young adults to become married because as soon as the precious baby arrives, joy causes all arguments to be forgotten. Nisa says that when your newborn is lying next to you, your heart is very happy and it is a wonderful thing because you love your children and talk with them. Gather hunter mothers are the kind, loving persons who have nurtured every person who has ever lived. Mom is aware, 24 hours per day, of each and every emotion being felt by her children and everyone else around her. We are each here because of mom and dad's relentless care. For millions of years, the first priority of every day has been to feed the youngsters. Adults are very persistent at this and feel that all is right in the universe when they see youngsters eating. What is the meaning of life for those human beings who are gather hunters? Here she is. We'll call her Molly. Molly spends her first few years in constant contact with her mother, receives the devotion of her father, receives song and praise and teasing from her siblings, and the adoring attention of her extended family and community. Every toddler knows that he or she is the center of the universe. Molly brings joy to everyone as she runs to greet them. When Molly misbehaves during her childhood, adults will say that her intelligence hasn't come to her yet, or that children have no sense. Today we might say that she does not know to stay out of the roadway. Molly's group members know that she will acquire sense as she matures into a social adult by her later teens. Children are discouraged from fighting, and we are told to hug and make up because we innately know that our lives depend on the smoothly functioning society. Adults know that anger is something that a person must ultimately learn to control themselves and that this is difficult. When two persons have an argument that is too great, other persons end it before it jeopardizes the society on which everyone's life depends. Fights that result in the loss of blood are taken very seriously. If Molly is so upset that she sleeps away from camp, risking the predators alone, 
then every group member will be upset the next day and the causal situation will be addressed. Molly will be in her teens before she learns most of the thousands of cultural details of daily life in the community. Molly, who is the meaning of life, will grow into a valued and contributing member of her community and become the mother of the continuing Molly. The Nakung say that she will live and live and live through the decades. The Gather Hunter world is a world of people within the shared community and there is equality between the sexes. This has been the way of life for our ancestors for a hundred thousand generations and it results from our innate predispositions. We are parenting mammals and social primates and we humans invent cultural details by the thousands. When unequipped for the task at hand, we innately look around for something to fashion into a tool. We invent a tool or procedure for every need, and with each new tool that we invent, our daily life changes a little. Notice that we never invent a tool to solve a problem before the problem exists. The gatherer hunter Ishii was found in 1911 in remote California and was taken to Berkeley. He was more amazed by the great number of persons than by their magical technology because people mattered to him, not their machines. Ishii revealed to anthropologists the secret of how to make flint arrows. Culture consists of our procedures for how to do everything in life and it consists of tens of thousands of details. For example, if you ask a person how you should fold a cloth the night before your wedding, someone will think of an answer that will be repeated for centuries. As we grow through childhood, we learn culture with fierce conviction. We will insult or ostracize any person who differs in the slightest way, and we are deeply upset if culture is too greatly changed later in life. Every gatherer hunter on the planet had the same set of ten handmade possessions that can all be carried at once including basket, bags, and stone tools. When every person has the same set of possessions, it also means that there can be no war to acquire the spoils of war, as sought by more modern emperors and other raiders. In more recent centuries, kings went to war to gain territory, ports, and taxes. Anthropologists always cringe to see gatherer hunter children playing with sharp objects, but the gatherer hunter has known few mishaps. Numerically, if the chance of being injured by mishandling sharp hunting tools is 1 in 1,000 per year, then a group of 100 persons will have such an injury only once every 10 years. Numerically, if 1 in 100,000 modern persons murder another, then a group of 100 gather hunters might have to wait 1,000 years for a murder to occur. We get sick dozens of times in our lifetime, but our innate immune system cures each bout with illness except for the last one. This gives our immune system a 95% success rate. When gather hunters are sick, a shaman or even the entire group sings and dances in the right way, passed down through the generations to chase away the illness. The secret to the shaman's 95% success rate is our innate immune system that has evolved over millions of years. About half of us Nakun gather hunters die before reaching the age of 20, and 20% 20 of us live to age 60. Those of us who live to 60 will likely live to age 70, compared to living to just age 83 in the U.S. today. The death of a child has always caused tremendous sorrow to his or her parents and family who cry for hours and days. Around the world, about half of us bury and half of us burn our beloved deceased rather than suffer the agony of seeing them lie on the ground for days or weeks. By the way, why do you see familiar shirts and logos? The clothing donated in the U.S. and such is taken to Africa and sold in cubic yard or meter bells to persons who next sell individual items to customers. 
This has disrupted the manufacturing of new clothes in Africa. While a lion hunts mostly with its feet and teeth, our ancestors used their increased intelligence to find exploitable behaviors in the prey. Here is a description of the approach used by those of us humans who are Amawaka and live in the Amazonian forest. Before leaving camp to pursue a specific animal, hunters mask their own odors by rubbing their bodies with some roots. When hunting a specific animal, they cover their bodies with the scent of that animal. Next they do a dance, consume a potion, and then off they go. The hunter does not wander aimlessly in search of animals, but instead harvests animals from the neighborhood. The hunter knows the sounds, footprints, activities, nesting habits, and favorite foods of each species of local animals he wants to eat. The hunter knows that if the leader of certain animal packs is stabbed or darted, then there will be a few moments of confusion, giving time to shoot more. After spotting a monkey band in a distant treetop, the hunter will make the sound of a fallen baby monkey. This may bring the monkey troop close enough to be able to dart one. Lions never make the sound of human infants to trick people into coming near. Hunter also knows to be aware of the seasonal condition of the monkey's troop's favorite fruit trees and will wait near a just ripening fruit tree for the arrival of the monkeys. Since jaguars are known to eat a certain bird, the hunter will sometimes attract a jaguar by making the sound of that bird. Fawns like to hide in a particular type of bush. When hunters see tracks around one of these bushes, they will wait nearby until the fawn returns. The hunter then shoots the fawn, but leaves the mother unharmed so she can continue to produce more fawns in the future. Hunters also note the location of each hunted animal's favorite food source. Whenever they then hear a certain animal they want to catch, the hunters have only to walk towards that animal's nearest food source. Youngsters are being trained as they listen to the daily discussions of hunting techniques and results and of animal tracks, behavior, and sounds. It does not happen very often that these forest dwellers hear a sound that they cannot identify. An unidentifiable sound is assumed to come from a spirit. Similarly, detailed knowledge is used in gathering edible plants from a region. The plant and animal contents within every footstep of the entire gathering and hunting area is mapped in this way. We also observe plant cycles, environments, and seasons. The food collectors do this for several hours per week throughout their lifetimes. Whenever you hear the word gatherer hunter, you should think of the intelligence and mass of knowledge of plants and animal habits that the group uses in harvesting food along with the customs used to find, prepare, and to share that food. Those of us humans living as gatherer hunter today make and use nets, hooks, rope, spears, and bowls and such and have complicated procedures to handle hundreds of daily needs. There are complicated procedures just to prepare otherwise inedible varieties of roots, nuts, and poisonous animals. The techniques of the Amawaka hunter illustrate what is meant by hunting with our brains rather than with our feet and teeth. Living by our wits in this way shows why so much intelligence was needed by our gatherer-hunter ancestors and what they were doing with it, even one million years ago. Plant and animal harvesting are tasks that our brains are made to do. How many days would it take for you to become very familiar with the plant and animal layout of your own neighborhood? It is a safe bet that you have already memorized the layouts of many streets and the aisle-by-aisle -aisle contents of many stores. Learning a layout is another of our effortless mental tasks. We have developed this ability because need consistently existed through the generations and proved to be useful in the survival of our ancestors. When we humans see animals, we naturally and effortlessly analyze their actions. We'll say, look at what that squirrel is doing.
From the air, we see huts along the outside edge of a circular area, area in a Kurikuro village. This is the Escalvado village. We see paths connecting each home to the center. The circle is about 300 meters or yards wide. Its central 50 meters are used for socializing and for ceremonies. Here is a view from the ground. The circular layout is of the utmost importance. Following the canal essence of symmetry, the homes of certain pairs of persons are placed on opposite sides of the circle. Generations names bounce around the village in ideal patterns that differ for females and males. Just as you and every other human being, canal parents live for their children, make toys for them, and help raise the children of others. The Canela are together and see another every moment of their lives. Each person knows the personalities of 50 others well enough to predict the behavior under various circumstances. They know each other through their lives, from infancy through the learning years of childhood, then parenthood, old age, and death when they're aged in their 70s. Such an age is nothing new. Imagine living with the same group of persons your entire life. That is what our ancestors have been doing for millions of years. We can expect that every village has jokesters, storytellers, gymnasts, slow movers, pleasant, unpleasant, grumpy, and happy smiling people. Gather hunters' homes typically contain a few baskets and clay pots and a bed. For tens of thousands of years, until just last century, every person knew how to make a basket and would simply make another whenever the old one wore out. Throughout the planet, we humans have made mud and grass or wattle and daub homes. Trenches are dug, upright poles are placed in them, and then the trench is refilled. Horizontal poles are attached to the vertical poles, and then walls and a roof are attached. Canal men build the homes that are then owned by the women. A house typically lasts for several years before showing wear. Daily activities in the courtyard always include dancing and singing from 3 a.m. to 6.30 a.m., and then again in the afternoon. Every morning, men work together to repair roads, maintain village boundaries, harvest rice, or to help on someone's farm. All peoples in the world agree that proper behavior is to do as the other does. Each culture differs only in the details. Proper behavior for Canela includes being open, not being egotistical or arrogant, sharing freely, being generous, not stingy, not being mean or angry, not talking bad of others or verbally abusing a person to decrease his or her self-image, avoiding actions that might start rumors, maintaining peace and harmony, and striving for the approval of others, especially those of your own age group. The Canela say that shame keeps a person from acting contrary to tradition. The Canela do not want to be shamed or to lose face by lying or stealing and believe it is evil to seek revenge against another member of the group. Do you agree that these are proper behaviors? The Canela value peacemaking and problem solving within the group, but sometimes conduct seasonal battles of revenge against neighboring groups. Rather than self-gratification, Canela individuals live more for the good of society through the available social activities. Canela maintain peace and harmony through singing, sports, dancing, constant joking, and sharing of the fun of the moment. They walk away from confrontation, refrain from extremes of behavior, and avoid public displays of affection. Jealousy or anger are soon forgotten because the opponents will be singing and dancing together every day. Older generations have much influence over the younger ones, and each person strives for the approval of his or her own age group. Canela adhere to tradition and believe that performing a task in a unique manner is considered egotistical and evil because it might unravel society. People obey family heads, elders, group leaders, and the chief. A canela is firstly a member of their nuclear and of their maternally extended family. A brother-sister bond compromises with the most serious interpersonal loyalty. During one ceremony, sisters hold their younger brothers to protect them from the mystical soul snatchers. Uncles particularly help nephews and aunts particularly help nieces. And one's extended family assists whenever the need arises. 
for example, when short on food or during a squabble with others. When threatened, a person might point out the offender that he or she has many relatives. We saw earlier that primate societies consist of cooperating extended families. Uncles sponsor the ear piercing ritual for their nephews and they teach new fins during the Pepe festival. This challenging ritual matures a young man and builds self-control. The young men are secluded for days in a room within their own house and rarely talk with anyone except for their uncles who lecture them on traditions. Throughout this time, the youths must never walk in the yard lit by sunlight or moonlight unless they cover themselves in mats or cloth. They must not step on dead twigs or dead leaves, and they must not eat meat or drink certain vegetable juices. Why do you suppose they can all do these things? They will answer because it has always been so. The Canella firmly believe that a young man becomes an adult only by following these procedures, and they firmly believe that by breaking these rules causes a youth to become a poor hunter, to be unable to withstand the midday sun, and that he will not be able to speak with ghosts as would be required for him to be a shaman. These are the corn planting, protecting, and harvesting ceremonies. They are led by a man whose maternal home must be located on the east side of the village circle. In the planting ceremony, he places a painted gourd bowl filled with maize kernels in the center of a plaza, and then people dance around it. After these seeds are planted in his wife's field, the other families begin planting their own fields. When the maize has grown to a height of one meter or a yard, a ceremony is held to induce the moon to keep parasites away from the crop. Everyone claps and sings their proper phrases and then dances from the north to the south across the plaza at a night under the full moon. People having food share with those who do not. The canela use plant materials, bark, branches, and leaves to make a great variety of items, including headbands, girdles, wristlets, sashes, fire fans, baskets, combs, carved club handles, and other items. Through the last 100,000 years of Gather Hunter society, each person makes his or her own clothes, baskets, tools, and decorations from the raw materials readily available in the surroundings. These items are not purchased from someone else. Either the extended family or the entire community combines efforts to construct homes and do any chores that are larger than can be accomplished by one person. All of the Gather Hunter peoples of the world have egalitarian societies devoid of rich and poor. We will always be amazed by the process of birth. For the canella, childbirth occurs indoors with the help of an elderly maternal relative who ties the umbilical cord with cotton, cuts it with an iron knife, paints the cord with radicuru juice, and places a cara bark juice on the cut. The child's mouth is cleaned and the mother is taken outside and washed, but she is not to be painted. The afterbirth is buried inside the corner of the house and the mats on which the mother has lain while birthing are taken by her mother and jammed into the fork of a nearby tree where they are left to be consumed by the next wildfire. As she puts the mats on the tree, she asks the son to keep the baby from harm. A canal mother rarely lets go of her new child for the first few months of life. The father waits outside during the delivery because men must not see a birth. After the pregnancy, his wife lies on her side while he sits on her hip to push back together her pelvic bones. During the pregnancy, he prepared the birthing mats and placed other mats around the bed to create a seclusion space in which the couple will remain, except for bathroom breaks, with their newborn separated from everyone else until one month after the child's navel string falls off. Until it falls, the mother wears a red ukuru painted purity belt. The navel string is saved and will be given to the child when he or she reaches the age of four. The child places it in the hole of a sucupriya tree and then grows to be as strong as that tree. During the pregnancy, both parents do things they believe to ensure the health of the child. During seclusion, the parents are not to paint or decorate themselves, cut their hair, eat any of several specific types of meat, or scratch themselves with their fingers. Instead, they use small sticks. When eating sweet potatoes, they must save the skins in a basket that is carried behind the house. They must not gnaw on like bones or the child's umbilical cord might rupture. They must not eat parrots, doves, armadillos, or saramas. The mother must not eat the honey of a tea bee unless it's mixed with manioc flour. Otherwise, she might have a miscarriage. 
They must not kill a snake if they encounter one. The father must avoid singing a paco or he might cause a miscarriage. Do you suppose these sad coincidences occurred in the past and caused the origin of these taboos? Many of a child's problems are fully believed to be caused by things that the parents have or have not eaten, and the corrective dietary steps are taken. Why do you suppose that the Canela do these things? They will answer, because it has always been so, and to do otherwise risks everything. Cultural details vary, but people do not. A Canela mother's primary goal is to take care of her children, feed them, socialize them, and keep them happy. We can be sure that a Canela parent often tells the spouse, well, it's you she takes after. We humans have a tendency to attribute events and misfortunes to food recently eaten or actions recently taken. This results in taboos concerning things that one can or cannot do or eat at certain times. Taboos are unique to each culture. The origin of such cultural detail might happen in the following way. Suppose a groom fell out of his hammock the night before his wedding, and then one week later he found out that his new mother-in-law was a nag. This might influence others being in sleeping on the ground the night before their weddings in order to avoid a similar fate. If one recently married man breaks his favorite bow, then it might be blamed on a sneeze during the wedding ceremony. If a sneeze or cough occurs during the wedding ceremony in your culture, what does it mean for the future of the newlyweds? Our animal brains have accumulated the ability to relate cause and effect, but we are not always right. You might have noticed a coincidence between two events in your life. How many such events do you think you could recognize during your entire life, and how many cultural details could be produced at this rate by a group of 100 persons throughout a 1,000 year period? There have been about 10,000 different cultures around the world through time, and each is equally strange and unbelievable. The people of some cultures knock on wood, throw salt over their shoulder, are careful not to walk on sidewalk cracks, and cringe for their future when they see black cats walking under 13 ladders. Why do you suppose they do these things? Their answer will be, because it has always been so. Seeing ourselves from the eyes of an outsider gives us greater appreciation of our own ways and for the ways of other peoples. This increases our tolerance for others. We gain respect for every culture of us humans and see that the other groups do not contain toy people, but thinking, feeling individuals who are really just like us and that they share the same desires and concerns and complications in their social lives. When we better understand the ways of others, we better understand the uniqueness and arbitrariness of our own ways. We can then begin to see our own culture from the eyes of an outsider and gain more respect for ourselves and for all other humans. As you ponder the differences and similarities between yourself and the members of another culture, such as that of the Canela, you are pondering what it is to be human. There has been little biological change in humans in the last 20,000 years. We have invented all of today's technological civilizations using nothing but our animal minds. A person from 20,000 years ago would be just as adept at engineering and sculpture as a person born anywhere on the planet today. No group should view another group as toy people. Our children are born with a slate clean of knowledge and experience and quickly acquire the culture in which they grow. If your own newborn baby and that of a Canela family were switched at birth, each would learn the culture of their adopted home and think that the other's culture was strange. Our Homo sapiens species is about 200,000 years old, and by 20,000 years ago, our cultural adaptions enabled us to spread throughout the planet. All of us human beings share the same nature. We are thinking and feeling creatures. Nature made us human and able to develop culture, but the details of culture are invented by us and invent we do. We have these big brains and use them to invent cultural details by the thousands. There are no simple people. Even our remote human ancestors had lives filled with thousands of cultural details. We live for our children each of us simply wants to laugh and joke with our family, friends, and community members. 
Whenever a human being is thinking, talking, or doing, that activity involves love and family or community and justice. That is all there is to any human being anywhere on the planet and throughout the last million years or so. You have the same emotions and needs as does every other person on the planet who is alive today or has been alive in the last million years. You love and nurture for the same reasons today as did your remote ancestors and for the same reasons as does a canela person and every other person on the planet. As Johnston describes, your emotions are like little packets that have traveled through time connecting you with your remote parenting mammal and social primate ancestors who lived long ago on the African plains. would be a big part of our diet, but not just that. Um, about 60% all year round is fruits and vegetables that we either grow in our garden or gather from the wild. And then spring through fall, a lot of fish and shellfish, and then red meat in the winter time. So you stay in this village. You're not like a, like a tribe that travels. We just represent one family here. Every family would be self-sufficient, you know, spring through fall, doing their own planting and fishing, and then you'd live as a larger extended family in the bark style houses in the winter time. But those are usually further inland. So you, every family would have two houses that they would use. You know, and communities would be between 200 and 3,000 families. Here is a reed home and its benches and chimney. You make cordage from different types of plant fibers like a milkweed, a dog bane, the inner bark of a basswood tree. You take those plant fibers out and you work the plant fibers together and you work them together and that's how you get your string. So cordage, a lot of the time, was considered to be too valuable to use as a roofing for a house. How we would tie a house together would have been like a lot of hickory bark, a lot of spruce root, um, what else would you use, basswood bark. But right, you see, right, right now what I'm doing, I'm just lining up the bark, so once I have a helper, they're gonna, I'm going to have somebody go on the roof and I'm gonna bring the bark up there and cap it off. But once a house like this is completed, it's going to last over 10 years. With the basic repairs. The storage bag. In my week too over there, there's no bureau drawers. Everything would be in bags. Well, simply we use water to pour it on any places, and uh, we use clay as well to. The bad news is that smallpox and other old world diseases arrived with the first European explorers and killed 50 to 90 percent of many populations that were encountered. They also play with balls and arrows, but we're not. We can hardly imagine its disruptive effects on a social group and the misery of losing so many family members. The area of the future United States contained at least 5 million persons before the arrival of the Europeans. 
but the population shrank to just one half million by the year 1800 and one quarter million Native Americans by the year 1900. Wampanoag residents cleared this land of trees but died of European smallpox just before the arrival of pilgrims who took up residence here. Throughout the first 150 years of Europeans living in New England before the Industrial Revolution, we lived in homes that had one or two rooms. Our homes were unpainted and did not have curtains wall pitchers or carpeting. Our first homes had dirt floors. Windows were not filled with glass because glass was very expensive. The window space might be filled with translucent paper. A wooden window might be hinged with straps made of leather, not metal. Alice Earl explains that it was emphatically an age of wood, not metal. If a family had glass windows but decided to move, then they removed the glass and took them with them because of their value even though they were not as clear as is today's glass. Nails were too expensive to use. This fence has wooden pegs rather than nails. Nails were expensive to make one by one by a blacksmith who cut long strips of metal into nail sized lengths and then flattened one end and sharpened the other. Yeah, we provided the, the carpenter's grill in the coffee house at this point. It was somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or 25,000. The rafters and walls of this house have no nails. If a family used nails in building their home and later decided to move, they would burn down the house and retrieve the nails from the ashes. To encourage movers to instead leave the house intact for another person, the governor began giving a box of nails to the departers. The blacksmith shop hung this sort of picture sign outside the shop because many customers were illiterate. Each type of shop had a relevant picture sign. This is the sign outside an apothecary shop, and here is the saddle maker's shop. Outside the home, a stump was used as a chair, and a log served as a bench. When making the bench, legs of green wood were placed snugly into those four top holes. As those legs dried and expanded, the fit became tight enough to support the weight of a person. Homes typically contained about 20 items. We had a few pots and ladles. We sat at the dining table on benches. We had a few wooden earthenware or perhaps pewter plates. Each person did not have their own plate. Instead, pairs of persons shared a plate and everyone may have shared a single drinking vessel. Continuing the medieval etiquette, each person was expected to wipe their mouth with a tablecloth before drinking out of the shared vessel. This trencher is a block of wood with a bowl-shaped indentation that was used for everyday meals. 
two persons would share this trencher. We often use sharp sticks as forks and clamshells as spoons. We had a few baskets. This basket is used to trap and catch fish that swim into it while heading downstream. We may have had one prized mirror, even if it didn't work so well. We ground grain by pounding it in a hollowed log, just as did the Wapanoag. Since the pounding could be heard for hundreds of yards or meters, one person announced a berth by pounding a certain beat. Here is a smaller version. A small pestle is on the storage cabinet. Additional items are stored in bags, just as did the Wampanoag. The Wampanoag also taught us to tap trees and make maple syrup. We followed the Wampanoag technique of burning to create the small, canoe-like log that catches the sap. We had a wooden chair or two, having no upholstery. Some chairs had reed seats. A three-legged chair sets well on unlevel ground inside the home and when milking cows. When a chair is not being used, it might be hung on the wall to keep it out of way. We had a candle holder made of tin and some homemade candles. This one is made from beeswax. Indoor bathrooms did not exist in New England. Emptying and cleaning the chamber pot was a daily chore. Chamber pots were used to avoid a freezing nighttime walk to the woods. By the year 1820, factory pots made in England were cheap enough that all but the poorest homes had one. The wooden enclosure kept this bed especially warm during winter nights. Three siblings could fit in this bed. The mattress is stuffed with chicken feathers and aired outdoors during the day. When the feathers start to smell, take them out, soak them in a tub of soapy water, and then put them back. And you can also stuff a bed with rags if you had to. Yeah, that's what my son's bed is stuffed with, just because you'd need to be able to take him out and wash it. He's only three. In many homes, the entire family might sleep in a single bed at night, and then sit on the bed during the day because it is their only chair. Bedrooms are rare. If two beds are available, then all of the females of the family sleep in one of the beds, along with any female hired help and any female guests that might spend the night. Similarly, all the males sleep together in the other bed. This meant that we became used to being surrounded by the warm bodies of our siblings and came to miss that after our siblings had moved out. Combining warmth this way helped us make it through the cold winter nights with temperatures below freezing. For the same reason, travelers would share a bed with strangers who happened to be staying at the same tavern. Since wintertime temperatures were below freezing, everyone was sharing a bed. A courting couple could share a bed but only with a so-called bundling board placed between them, as seen in this 18th century example. The bed was held together with ropes that had to be tightened periodically. This device is used to tighten the ropes. People used a basin to wash themselves with water. Soap was reserved to wash only clothes. It was common to see mothers picking lice from the heads of their children. 
As our homes need repair, we make imaginative use of available materials because factory-made replacement parts do not exist. The cracks in home walls are filled with mud. Doors that won't shut might simply be allowed to hang sideways from one corner. Since glass is rare and expensive, we repair broken windows by stuffing them with rags, hats, or bags. The walls of a house are usually bare because paintings are too expensive. Only 10% of families can afford a single painting or engraving. These usually depict the homeowner. Since decorations are too expensive, our homes have very few of them. There are no clocks in the home before the Industrial Revolution. In many towns, not even one person owns a pocket watch. The house contained no insulation at all, so the summer heat and winter cold could only be endured. Winter snow blew indoors through cracks and formed little piles. Summer heat might melt indoor candles. Each house had a fireplace that was used for cooking, and it also provided light and was the only source of heat in the winter. But you might stand with the burning hot fire at your back while holding a frozen dish rag in your hands. Water would freeze in a bowl placed a few steps away from the fireplace. An axe is used most every day by the farmer to chop firewood. Different wood are used to produce a steady cooking heat or a lower heat for cooking certain dishes. The fireplace burns such a mountain of wood as this each year. The fireplace was constantly burning and making the sound of crackling logs. If the fire went out, a dish full of live coals might be fetched from the nearest neighbor or a spark would be struck from flint into easily ignitable material such as that of a dried maple tree. A slow burning fire could be lit deep within a hollow elm tree where it could get little air, burn for weeks, and supply coals to relight the home's fireplace. Within the fireplace, a smaller fire whose heat was less intense is pulled off to a side to warm certain foods. Different heats were used for different purposes, just as is done today. We also cook our meals by placing heavy metal pots directly into the hot coals, or by hanging pots above the fire. Smaller cooking pots have legs so that we can place the pot directly into a small fire. We also control cooking temperature by placing pots near or far from the fire. Just stripping some marjoram right now, but there's a tansy in the bowl. And so it's, uh, I'll be frying it pretty soon. It's uh, with spinach and cream. We raise chickens for eggs and we grow food in gardens. In the new colonies, each home has a separate garden area rather than harvesting from some rows of a communally worked village plot as was done in medieval Europe. Oxen have not yet been transported from Europe to be used for plowing. Hawk points out that the transplanted persons had no plans of changing their culture as they moved to the new world. Each group set up life in their new home to match that of their old European culture. 
but noticed that the culture of their children was no longer European, it was European-American. Before Europe's Industrial Revolution had arrived in New England, only the wealthiest of us could afford to paint our homes. But as chemical factories come into existence and begin to mass produce inexpensive paint, then most every home is painted. And soon after that, around the year 1840, we begin to surround a, a yard with a white picket fence. We also start planting decorative flowers around our home. In the year 1800, another difference between Europe and the U.S. was in the volume of factories. There were thousands of factories in England before there was one in the U.S. The Industrial Revolution started in England around the year 1760 and initially involved the production of wool cloth. Several steps are involved in turning fleece, which is sheep hair, into cloth. Fleece must be cleaned of dirt, beaten, combed to remove tangles and impurities and to get the fibers to form parallel rows, carded to fluff its fibers, spun into thread, wove into cloth, brushed to remove clumps, dyed, cleaned of oils by a fuller, pressed and folded. Before the year 1760, these steps were not performed within one factory building but were done by a series of persons, each doing one step and working within his or her own home. A cloth merchant might buy raw fleece and then take it to each worker, one after another, in that series of homes. The G's re describe this as a factory spread around town. When merchants later began gathering that sequence of workers into a centralized building, the factory was born. Since there are many persons working within one building, ancient water-powered machinery became more applicable. By chance, the water-powered factory and its mass production was the key to manufacturing low-cost goods. With each passing decade, Factory mechanization spreads to the production of an increasing number of items made of wood, cloth, or iron. England tried to keep secret the equipment and procedures of its factories by outlawing their export. It took about 50 years for those secrets to make their way to the U.S. to begin its industrialization in earnest around the year 1820. Soon, factory-made items include brooms, clothing, drapery, wallpaper, and furniture and such. For example, by 1830, 20% of U.S. homes have a carpet, as seen below the chair in the center. Carpet is expensive and prized. It is preferably cleaned with fingers to avoid being scraped and worn by a broom. The window might be shuttered to keep sunlight from fading the prized carpet. There begins an increase in the number of tools and decorations in homes. Our homes had contained about 20 material possessions from the time of the first sedentary groups of gatherer hunters and throughout the first 10,000 years of civilization up until the Industrial Revolution. And then within a few decades, the number of items grows from 20 to 200 and even to 2000 today. In contrast, the contents of the homes of the most wealthy of us looked much the same throughout the 1600s and into the 1800s because we continued to fill our homes with the same expensive handmade items. In our homes, we decorate every spot of the floor, walls, and ceiling. The small town's general store is beginning to stock a wide variety of goods and from many places around the world. Ships were coming into Boston Harbor every day. He would uh, have them packaged up and sent back to his store by way of, of wagon using Teamsters. And uh, it was a, a way for the farmer and his family to meet the world, so to speak. 
Most every New England village had a general store, maybe two. Imported cloth now includes wool, silk, velvet, corduroy, linen, French silk, Russian linen, cotton from India, Chinese silk, and factory made prints. They sell dry goods in bulk because serving size packages do not exist. We have a stationery section, an apothecary section, hardware section, of course all the dishes, the, the fabric. Such quantity and variety of items was unimaginable to the peoples of the previous centuries living in their handmade world. Shoes were beginning to be made in left and right foot versions. Larkin explains that families bartered for services or goods at any village shop by bringing such things as butter, cheese, eggs, beeswax, feathers, axe handles, hats, threads, and surplus crops to exchange for dry goods, cloth, nails, molasses, and rum. The values of the exchange goods were agreed upon through haggling. Goods did not have to be exchanged at the time of the transaction, but were instead recorded in a balance book. Balances might run for months and were often settled around January 1st. Barter means that food, goods, and labor are used like today's coins. Currency was rarely used in the general store or in any other transaction in the countryside. Any currency that was used was usually foreign, most often the Spanish dollar. Within the home, hired help was not paid in cash. Instead, helpers move into your house and exchange their labor for your food and clothing and education. The hired help became part of the family Similarly, apprentices moved into the homes of their trainers. Ever since its colonial beginning, travel has been common in the U.S. and most of it was done on foot. Even by 1840, only half of farming families had even a single horse and almost no horses were kept in urban areas. It is common to see three family members riding on one horse. We typically walk two miles to school four miles to church, and ten miles to a weekly event. If we walked more than 15 miles, then we would spend the night before returning. My friend Datman Escher's grandparents said that they had to walk uphill both ways to and from school. The changing way of life during the 19th century as we switched from working our own family farm within the neighborhood to being factory workers. Nothing about today's big government, big business, or even our neighborhoods makes any sense until we learn of the social consequences of our switch from working the family farm to being factory workers. In the early 1800s, as the Industrial Revolution was developing in England and Europe, in New England we were living in communities of single-family farms. A typical family lived in a small house located on their own farmland, not in town. Each farmhouse was within sight of those of a number of other families because the farmhouses were separated by the lanes of the farmland. You could see the candlelight of your neighbor's home from your own front door. Nylander explains that as you approached your neighbor's doorway, you would likely hear the whir of the spinning wheel and the thump of the butter churn.
Nylander explains that in the evening, the family and guests gather around the snug fireside to sing, play music, sew, knit, make buttons, whittle clothespins and such, repair harnesses or furnishings, and to listen while one person reads aloud from a book of fiction, poetry, dramatic plays, philosophy, theology, or even chemistry. Nylander explains that relatives and neighbors enter households freely in an act of coming and going to share joys and sorrows and to offer assistance, advice, and support. The same girls who work together as adolescents spinning thread and husking corn will soon fit each other's wedding gown, run their own hospitable kitchens, encourage each other during labor, and have established places in the community. The community has its sages, high spirits, willing helpers, and busybodies. The household feeds any friend or relative who happens to be in the area at mealtime and will put them up for the night when overtaken by darkness or weather. Refreshments are given to any neighbor or stranger who walks by or asks for information or is chasing an errant animal or looking for berries to gather. Food and a bed is given to traveling peddlers and those who repair shoes, baskets, or tinware and such. They might sleep in the barn, by the fireplace, or even in bed with everyone else. In one week, a house might receive visits from brothers, aunts, cousins, cousins of cousins, and friends. Most would be fed and some would spend the night. A visiting woman might share the bed with the wife and husband of the house. Visitors often bring their sewing and such so that they can work while chatting and sharing news. A shopkeeper's home is especially busy. In one month, the household might make 100 extra meals and have 70 overnight guests who have come to conduct business and will join in whatever work is being done. Less visiting occurs during the busy spring and fall portions of the agricultural cycle. More visiting occurs when snow cover makes for easy travel by sleigh. Sleighs enable one to visit a home even 10 miles away and return the same evening. A full moon provides light into the evening, which is something that today's big city dwellers do not notice because of the bright street lights. Several sleighs full of people might travel together to drink at a tavern. Hawk explains that the farmhouse was not an isolated entity, but a focal point of the neighborhood, which extends outward in a radius of about one day's travel. The extended family members and their wards living in this area cooperate as a unit. A call for help from a faraway relative is answered. This unit performed all the functions that the medieval European village had done, including the care of sick, indigent, orphan, decrepit, and senile. In New England, it takes the combined efforts of many persons working all day long just to maintain the household. The well-working home was said to be a well-regulated home. A lone person cannot do all that is needed. When one woman becomes ill, the other women of the house must fill in for her by working extra hours, and there is extra help from women of the neighboring homes. The same thing occurs when a man is ill. To repay for the knitting help done by a neighboring woman today, a man might go to her house tomorrow to chop wood. He will be fed while he is working there until evening. A woman might sew a shirt for a man who is helping thresh wheat at her house. Household women performed a variety of so-called earning work that could be exchanged for credit at stores or was done on a day labor basis within the community's web of exchanges. Nylander explains that People having rum drinks at a tavern might pay with potatoes, fish, turnips, butter, beef, veal, or pork. Here is a list of the payments received 
by Asa Talcott, who was a tailor and part-time farmer. Most every specialist was also a part-time farmer. We can imagine that some farmers knew that Talcott was fond of salmon and would give a higher value to it than would the miller. Talcott would exchange the received items and his own services and surplus food to the other people in the community. And the tailor sometimes made clothing for motherless children. In big cities, actual cash is more often used. Shop owners indicate whether they accept the bartering of so-called country pay or if they accept cash only. Less than half of Talcott's tailoring work is spent making new clothes. Mostly, he repairs clothes to extend their usable lifetime. Farmers often bring cloth to the tailor to fit and cut, and then the farmer takes the pieces back home to sew themselves. The farmer contracted with the specialist in this so-called bespoke work. The same web of exchanges occurs among farmers, potters, butchers, millers, coopers, ministers, tanners, carpenters, lawyers, doctors, and other specialists. Each specialist is also a part-time farmer, hayer, sower, harvester, and maple syrup maker. Many specialties are seasonal. Those involving water mills cannot be done in the winter when the weather freezes water. The work of each family member contributes to the well-being of all. Most work provides food, clothing, heat, or light. The family is not self-sufficient in food and goods, but the entire village as a whole is nearly self-sufficient. Within the homes of the community, mothers loan and borrow items and the labor of themselves and their children on a daily basis. Each mother knows the equipment and talents of every family. Nylander says that neighboring mothers trade the help of daughters just as they trade pots. Each woman keeps mental notions of exchange balances rather than written tallies. In the community system of exchange, New Englanders ask themselves, what labor and good should we trade with which neighbors so that we, or they, can accomplish this or that? A child went to work young. Daniel Drake of Mazelik, Kentucky, described his childhood chores. At the age of eight, he rode on a horse to steady it while his father plowed. He planted seeds as his father covered them. He weeded. He stood guard over the crops by throwing rocks at squirrels and crows. He cared for stock, and he chopped and hauled wood. At eleven, he was given an old gun to scare pests from the field. At twelve, he held the plow and guided the horse himself. At thirteen, he split rails and built fences. By sixteen, he was doing a full man's work in the fields. Danielle's sister Lizzie, at the age of ten, was sent to a farm one mile away to watch over twins and their aged father for an entire week. She had complete charge of the house. She woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning, walked a distance to get water, made breakfast, and got the children ready for school. She then cleaned the dishes and began preparing dinner. New England was the only region of the U.S. having public elementary schools in the year 1800. There was one schoolhouse for every two to four square miles, which is three to six square kilometers. Some schools were funded from local taxes, while others were funded through the barter system. For example, a family might bring a load of wood for the school to use, or they might bring a load of something that the teacher could trade. In the 1840s, Horace Mann argued that universal education would guarantee the nation's political and economic stability and that it was a public matter for the public's good and should not remain a luxury of the elite. He said it would prepare informed and intelligent citizens and that in a republic, ignorance is a crime. We must prepare children to become good citizens, develop their capacities, enrich their minds, and imbue their hearts with the love of truth and duty. We agree with this today. We consider education to be an important part of being human, 
and believe that no one should be denied an education. With each new thing that you learn or accomplish, you become a fuller person, a more complete citizen, and are then able to contribute more to the operation and progress of our mutual society. Horace Mann said, Be ashamed to die before you have won some battle for humanity. In 1820, the curriculum of the New England public school was planned to be more practical than the Greek and Latin schooling of past centuries. Parents believed the purpose of school was to teach children enough reading, writing, and arithmetic to enable them to add up a bill of purchase and to read and understand things like property deeds, the almanacs, astrological recommendations, and especially the Bible. A particular reader and speller pair became popular because they also taught moral habits. Teachers soon added geography, history, and science. School attendance was not yet mandatory. Classes opened after harvest and closed before planting season began. Often, two and three-year-olds went along to school with their older siblings. Children were kept at home whenever they were needed for farm work. Most five to fifteen year olds spent three to eight weeks per year in school. Since the western frontier had fewer schools, it often occurred that frontier children had the opportunity to learn to read and write only if their parents could teach them. Higher education was expanding in the east, but it was not meant for women and especially not meant for women to use in pursuing professions. About 75% of the population could read and write. Law forbid us slaves to become literate because slave owners knew to try to restrict minds. But still many of us learned to be carpenters, metalsmiths, tanners, harness makers, shoemakers, and fiddlers and such. House. So this is where all the students would come to get their education starting around three or four and going until their late teens. Or early twenties. Early twenties in some cases, yes. Depending <coughs> if you did care, had some sort of disability or yeah, yeah something was wrong with you. There were no there were no attendance laws, so you didn't need to go for a set number of days. So there were two terms, one in the summer, one in the winter and you could pretty much come whenever you wanted. There were no graduation requirements or any of that. In the winter, you had the full range of ages, three or four to late teens, early 20s, because uh, there wasn't as much to be done. But in the summer, it was mostly young kids under the age of 10, uh, because the older ones were at home helping out mom and dad on the farm. And they sent the young ones here to get them out of the way. So. You, the two terms were three months each, and you'd go Monday to Friday, half days on Saturdays. Um, it was around 9 to 4 with a one-hour uh, dinner break and two 15-minute recesses. And other than that, you're sitting in your seat memorizing your lessons. There'd be ink in here, and you'd dip it in, and there's, it's hollow in here, so it would fill up, and then you can write down and practice your penmanship. So paper was very expensive at the time, about a cent for each sheet, and the average day labor only made 50 cents. So you didn't want all the kids to start on paper, so you used slate boards for the beginning. So as you can see, all the ages would be here at once. So not separated by classes or grades. Or, you are separated by gender. Girls are on one side, boys are on the other. And that extends even into recess. Gentlemen go out for recess first and ladies are next. It was mostly self-guided education. They would be reading the book and reciting and memorizing. In the year 1709, people found how to make coke from coal. Coke produces enough heat to reduce iron ore, and with the growing industrial revolution, huge quantities of low-cost iron are produced for the first time and used for many things. 
In 1813, the cast iron plow began to replace the metal covered wooden plow. John Deere introduced a steel plow in 1837 that was strong enough to turn tough prairie sod. Cast iron cooking and heating stoves appeared around the year 1820 and changed our cooking technique for the first time in a million years. It took a few decades for the use of iron stoves to spread across the nation. When one family was the first in their town to purchase a cooking stove, the other town's people might warn that it would poison them all, but instead, within two years, most every family had stoves. One woman said that the first time she started a fire in her stove, it seemed like magic. Instead of turning meat on a stick placed over the fire, the iron cooking stove had top side heating services placed at waist height. Heavy iron pots no longer had to be lifted into and out of the blazing hot flames of the fire. Since stoves used just one third as much wood as did the open fireplace, less wood had to be chopped on the farm or purchased in the city. Cookbooks quickly appeared for this newfangled machine, just as they would 150 years later when microwave ovens first appeared. The preparation and cooking of foods has always been among humanity's most complex procedures. We humans first began full-time farming in ancient Mesopotamia about 10,000 years ago. Our subsequently invented cities required many new occupations, but usually 90% of us have been occupied as farmers. This was still a case for those of us in the United States in the year 1800, but increasingly less so with each successive decade. In the year 1800, 80% of us are full-time farmers, 95% are full or part-time farmers, 10% are self-employed artisans or shopkeepers, and another 10% of us are hired laborers. In the year 1900, only 40% are farmers, and in the year 2000, only 1% are farmers. As we industrialized, the percentage of us living in urban areas would grow from 10% in the year 1800 to 40% in the year 1900. As has been the case for every farming family in the previous 10,000 years, our activities were tied to the local agricultural seasons of planting and harvesting. Weddings and births were clumped around those months of the year that allowed a break in agricultural activity. For 10,000 years, much of the daily conversation between farmers has involved the weather and crops, and the health and multiplication of livestock. We spent many hours behind the plow. In 1837 in Connecticut, the farmer Horace Clark wrote in his diary, I have followed that plow for more miles than any man ever did or will ever do. For the last 10,000 years, or until the last century, everyone knew what the purpose of a plow was and what it looked like. Many of us big city residents today aren't too sure of its purpose. Each day was filled with hard physical exertion for all, but no one complained of the work because they had no idea there could be any other way. In the year 1800, a single person alone could not handle all the duties needed to make a home function. Mills are prepared from scratch, clothing is kept in repair, the house and farm need repair, crops and animals are tended, a few surplus items are made for sale, and socializing is done. Until the 20th century, all of these chores were done by hand, as it was a handmade world. How many hours per week does your family spend doing these things today? And what sort of things do you now do with your spare time? Each city had one dozen night watchmen, working in pairs, watching for fires, and calling out on the hour that, two of the clock and all is well. The 12 watchmen are the closest thing to a police force. The town's residents were the fire department. An alarm brought everyone out to quickly form a double line between the burning building and the nearest stream or well. 
Each household brought a fire bucket, which was made of leather and might be marked with the family's name or initials. Water-filled buckets were passed along one of the two lines, and the empty buckets were passed back along the other line. When finished, everyone retrieved their bucket. Both the original purpose and manifestations of our social genes are demonstrated as the community pools efforts on chores deemed larger than one person can do alone. A large field is best cut and harvested on a singularly appropriate day. The help of many persons from the community is beneficial in accomplishing this chore and to do it in one day. The neighboring families combine efforts and the nearby town is emptied as its merchants close shop to join in the project. Haying is handled with the excitement of a battle. Lines of people with long handled cysts work across the field. A slow cutter would, would receive friendly insults. Young men consider hang to be a physical challenge and a contest and strive to be considered the best mower or to be assigned head of a group. This work lasted 14 to 16 hours through the long summer day from dawn until dusk and even later during the bright light of a full moon. Cutting hay required the most work of all. Potatoes, oats, rye, corn, and wheat were harvested later in the year and did not require such a frantic rush as did haying. Threshing grain was done in the 10,000 year old labor intensive fashion. Harvested corn is stacked into a number of high piles. Neighboring families come to help remove the corn husk from each ear. Groups were assigned to each pile and then races would occur. Finding a lucky red ear meant pending courtship. Shucking corn was an occasion for celebration and every celebration involved heavy drinking and dancing. Alice Earle explains that after a heavy snow, community members used oxen-powered plows to push the snow off the roads. Everyone joined in to clear the roads because everyone needed to go to the school, church, post office, and town and be able to make social visits. Plowing began with those living farthest out of town. As they traveled inward, they were joined by others and their oxen. A tired ox would be left in someone's barn to be retrieved later. All raced toward the center of town where roads converged. There would be dozens of oxen and sleighs parked at the tavern. Community members would walk as far as 10 miles to meet at a homestead that needed trees to be cut down or needed rocks to be cleared from a field. Cut trees are left to dry for several months before everyone gathers again to drag away and pile up the logs. Accidents and injuries might occur while working as men would drink much rum. Everyone helped, including the Supreme Court Justice who lived in the area. Neighbors also worked the crop field of a sick person. People would meet to raise up a building, which might be a barn, church, or a school. They might break a bottle of rum over the central ridge pole. While we observe this modern day barn raising by an Amish community, we'll discuss the aspect of human nature that is the exchange of mutual assistance. We see that a few days help in harvesting might be traded for help in spinning thread, shucking corn, peeling apples, or tailoring a shirt. Some firewood or meat might be traded for the loan of a horse or wagon, or maybe for a few weeks pasturing of a cow. Neighboring families exchanged goods, utensils, and the help of themselves and their children. No money was paid in these help exchanges, but mental balances were kept. Neighbors exchanged help in doing many chores, but especially in those that were large or had to be done so quickly. 
such as in cutting the hay field. Soon after new families moved into a New England community, they were quickly entangled in the local system of exchanging goods and help. Everyone gave and received strength, time, and goodwill. The community was a social contract. These agricultural examples of mutual aid among neighbors is similar to those of other times and places. We saw that a group of Yoruba farming families might work one farmland at a time, and that medieval European villagers might work the entire crop field as a community. In an example of our innate predisposition for mutual exchange, the Amish still prefer today to work together as a community, even using hand tools, rather than have one person work alone with a machine that, it is said, does the work of many persons, but reduces communal ties. Do today's parents feel that family ties are reduced when children watch TV and play video games? Would you remove those devices to maintain strong family relations? Amish do. Amish are pro-family and community and avoid any technology that reduces those ties. Our biological ancestors first formed societies because they found it mutually beneficial to exchange assistance in any task that was larger than could be handled by one individual. That is the golden social rule. The original tasks were looking for food and watching for predators. A lone ancestor would not survive for long. Ever since we first became social primates a few million years ago, we have known that our lives depend on the continued and smooth functioning of our society. If the social group unravels, then we would again be going it alone. This is why we are deeply upset by anything, from a fist fight to a crime, that disrupts our society. This is why the news of a murder properly upsets you and all other members of your social group. We are a social species. We innately know that the end of society would mean the end of our own lives. We can now see that the farming families of 1820 New England were simply doing the same thing. In today's push-button big city, we have fewer reasons to exchange assistance with our neighbors because very few chores require the efforts of more than one person or more than a few moments of time. Moving day is one of our largest chores. During the switch from farming to factory work through the 1800s, there was much contemporary discussion about the readily apparent lessening in community ties since factory workers were finding fewer reasons to exchange help with their neighbors than had their farming parents. Because we are a social species, some of us who live in the big city today naturally get an ill feeling in our stomach about our seemingly insufficiently connected society. Neighbors still help each other the instant a need arises, but it often acquires a natural disaster to produce a visible need to which we will then innately respond. And we are then relieved to see the exchange of help because it makes us feel that we are members of a society after all. The innate feeling that is propelling you to exchange help with other people is the same feeling and drive that was experienced by our distant biological ancestors beginning several million years ago. This urge to exchange assistance creates a social species. Without this urge, a species does not become social. Social systems and the golden social rule necessarily occur as a pair. As Johnson explains, that feeling is like a little emotional packet that has traveled through time, connecting you to the first humans, and even to your more remote social primate ancestors. The urge we feel to exchange help and to pool resources today is the same feeling and mental state experienced by our first social primate ancestors. Whether exchanging help in the search for food and warning of predators, or in the 19th century chore of harvesting the hay crop. Today's individual acts of mutual assistance are due to the same innate drive to cooperate that has existed since we first became social primates. 
Our mutually beneficial exchange of help today merely occurs in a less directly visible manner as each of us contributes to the operation of our society by working our daily job. Our civilization is the sum of the efforts of each of us. On the surface, our daily lives today seem more independent of the other members of our community than occurred in the early 1800s, but our mix of specialized occupations actually makes us more interdependent today than we have ever been in our past. Our interdependence is visible as the traffic seen to occur as everyone is going about their daily jobs that combine into our civilization. Our civilization operates today only because of the combined efforts of all of us doing our daily job. It is not everyone for themselves in our society today. We are pulling efforts every day. Each of us contributes our lifetime's effort in keeping our civilization going and in pushing its progress. How do you gauge success in life? What is the meaning of life? What are the most important things in life for you? What makes you happy? What should be the priorities for the mutual efforts that are our regional and global society? Which criteria do we use to measure the success of our attempts to govern ourselves? Very frequently, tell your political leaders, we might take the advice of the Dalai Lama and at the end of each day, review our thoughts and actions and repeat often those that made us happy and avoid those that did not. Let's go contribute our effort to make our mutual world a better place for all of us. Vote against war and help to ensure that all of us get the opportunity to contribute all that we can so that our whole will be all that it can be. Understanding our own nature along with something about the flow of civilization helps us form a more clear idea of our place in the universe and helps us to together choose where next to take our civilization by choosing goals that best match our own nature. Everything you see from roads to temples and every institution and policy on the planet were imagined and built by our own efforts. And we see that we are in fact controlling the operation of our civilization and its destiny. Together, we will build our future.